thank you for coming, everybody. Great to have you here. And I'm really looking forward to this evening just as much as I think you are. Um, so for those of you that have not joined us before, Science Talks is an online series of informal talks where anyone can come and explore the latest ideas in science research, research and technology. These talks will be followed with a Q&A, so make sure you send in your questions after. Um, they are designed to engage the public in learning about recent research in science. The talks which are given by experts in their field provide an opportunity to stimulate discussion around some of the most exciting topics in modern science. Um, we're gonna change it up a little bit today. Um, we do have a survey that we would love for you guys to fill out. Um, I see some familiar faces here and you've been here for most of them, I believe. So welcome back. Um, we would love to hear what you think. Um, so please, there'll be a link in the chat. So click on the link after the event and let us know what you think. We're always looking to improve. Um, so to start things off, just a little bit of Zoom etiquette. So please um, keep your microphones on mute so we don't have background noise. Um, as well, during the Q&A, um, send your questions in the chat and we'll be able to get to as many as we can because I'm sure you'll have lots of questions. Also, um, this event is being recorded so we can show it after. Um, we would love to see your faces, but if you don't want to, perfectly fine. Um, this session is a conversation with an expert. It is not a debate. Um, so please join in with an open mind and be inclusive. Um, we encourage engagement and conversation, but this is not a place for debate um, or self-promoting. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to take a quick second to appreciate the community. Oh, sorry, I did skip that. So the program. <laughs> Um, the program for today will start off with our expert speaker, um, followed by a Q&A session. Again, send in your questions in the chat, and then we'll finish off by taking a group photo. So please turn on your cameras for that. And I just want to take a quick second to thank the community that got us started. Uh, the City of Abbotsford, the Vancouver Foundation, Abbotsford Community Foundation through the Responsive Neighborhood Small grant fund. Thank you so much for getting us started and making this possible. As well, we are amazingly supported here at Science Talks and we could not thank these very special people and companies enough for making this possible for us and bringing all of this great information to you. So huge thank you to the University of the Fraser Valley, the Abbotsford Tech District, Envision Financial, Connext, UFB Alumni Association, TEDx Abbotsford, TEDx Community Foundation, as well as City of Abbotsford and Vancouver Foundation. Thank you so much for supporting us. You are amazing. Uh, today, we will be hearing about building an innovative ecosystem in the Fraser Valley. And here to introduce Dr. Thomas, we have Craig Toes, VP External at UFB. We are delighted to have Craig here tonight and so thankful for the support from UFB to be, to be able to make this help happen. Welcome, Craig. I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Tiffany, and it's great to be here. And we see we have lots of people joining us tonight on a very busy, dramatic night with elections and all. So thanks for being here with us. First, I'd just like to acknowledge that this beautiful place uh, that we all enjoy is home where we live, work, and play, and learn is in the heart of the traditional territory, the unceded territory of the Stalo people, people of the river. We are grateful for the way they've stewarded this land and that we now benefit. And I'd just like to recognize our closest neighbors, the Matsui, Sumath, and Kwantlen First Nations. Well, tonight's speaker is Dr. John Thomas. He holds the position of BC Regional Chair, Canada-India Partnerships Development at University of the Fraser Valley. Working out of UFB's South Asian Studies Institute, he brings a wealth of international research experience to the position, which he leverages while fostering innovation and economic development through, throughout the Fraser Valley. 
He came to UFE from Simon Fraser University, where he taught at the graduate level in management of technology MBA program. His postdoctoral research on science-based university spin-off emergence at, UF, at SFU was awarded a MITAX Elevate Strategic Postdoctoral Fellowship. He uses publication and patent data in novel ways and uh, to unpack and, and compare science and technology commercialization across universities, industries, and regions. Dr. Thomas is also the director of the Esposito Family Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. FC is a new research hub at UFE, established through a generous endowment provided by the Esposito family. The center works to foster an inclusive, vibrant and resilient space for innovation and entrepreneurship initiatives for UFE and our Fraser Valley communities. FC's activities include research, course development and mentoring both students and local entrepreneurs. It also emphasizes community outreach through events and projects that explore the interactions between technology, innovation and society. Dr. Thomas is particularly interested in science-based entrepreneurship and looks forward to helping scientists transform their ideas into businesses with significant long-term societal impact. Please welcome Dr. John Thomas. Thank you, Craig. Uh, let me begin by sharing my slides. Thank you, uh, Craig, for, for, for that very generous and, and, and gracious uh, introduction. Uh, I, I find this, this whole concept of holding science talks and, and bringing researchers closer to the community as, as a wonderful initiative. And I would like to congratulate the organizations uh, funding this initiative. Uh, this is exactly the kind of initiative that, that we should bring forward when we are looking to build an innovation ecosystem. <clears throat> so today I'm going to be speaking about a topic which is very close to my heart. I've been working uh, and, and studying scientist entrepreneurs for, for close to two decades now. And uh, today I'll be speaking about the challenges that uh, entrepreneurs face and, and the kind of exciting technologies that uh, we are surrounded by the kinds of challenges that that entrepreneurs can can face in in getting these technologies commercialized and out into the market. So when we look at 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 this figure, we we see that universities funded by government are are doing a lot of research and teaching and that's where many of the ideas that that underpin great companies that underpin startups with really innovative technologies often emerge on the basis of work done at universities and yet while canada is is great at at uh, and and does a good job on a number of metrics for assessing research in the handover to industry, in the handover to startups, uh, in the handover to large companies, there is more work that we need to do. If you look closely at this figure, what you see is a lot of financial resources are spent on research and, and teaching, and yet startups have a challenge when they are developing prototypes. Once they raise early stage financing, some of them are able to get to a product and still there is the adoption challenge in that not all companies which develop a product are able to generate sales. And so herein comes the second challenge and thus very few entrepreneurs or few entrepreneurs are able to reach full commercialization, especially of science-based products. And thus universities play an important role both in the generation of ideas, in the generation of technologies, and they also provide the talent that goes on to help scientists and entrepreneurs start these companies. 
to give you an example of the kinds of technologies that we have around us today, I'd like to point out the artificial intelligence and AI app that has been developed by Google, which allows you uh, to, to not wait on hold. So I'm sure many, if not all of us have been placed on hold where we have to listen to various kinds of music and we do lose quite a bit of time. And yet now we have technologies which allow us to keep focusing on the work that we need to do and get back to those conversations when there is another human on the line. This is based on duplex technology, which has been developed by Google. Uh, a more fascinating aspect of this technology, which, which emerged in 2018, is the ability of the tech, of the AI tech, to develop um, the ability to book appointments. So many of us have multiple scheduling needs and we need people to help book us uh, appointments for a variety of reasons. And now we have an assistant and I would encourage all of you to click on the link after the talk and explore for yourself the, the way in which the AI tech is dealing with actual humans and the human on the other end uh, is not able to differentiate, is not able to understand that, that the person is or, or the entity is an AI. So there are very rapid advancements in artificial intelligence. And this just goes to show the speed with which technology is evolving. Another area uh, that, that Canadian companies uh, and, and Canadian economy is particularly interested in is mining. If we look at some recent studies, we'll see that automation uh, can, can impact 40 to 80% of the workers at a mine. And now we have nearly 500 automated trucks doing surface mining and they are already operational worldwide. There are significant advantages uh, to automation in some spheres. There are areas or there are jobs and occupations which have higher levels of risk than normal and having machines and having automated equipment and automated trucks uh, do these kind of jobs allows us to have higher levels of safety. We already have about 39 of these automated trucks in operation now in Canada. This just goes to show how technology is not only being developed, but is also being rapidly adopted worldwide. Another technology that is uh, rapidly being adopted worldwide is 3D printing. If we look at the way this, this technology has evolved, it has a history of about 25 to 30 years. And for many years, people considered, considered it to be a, a, a technology that's, that's based on hobby. And, and people buy a 3D printer and use it for their personal use. But now uh, we have many ways in which 3D printing is being used in very demanding industries like aerospace and is more than several billion dollars industry already. So what we see is not only are these technologies emerging, they are moving forward rapidly, they are getting adopted by people. To give you an example of the speed of adoption, what you can see is that the US hearing aid industry converted to 100% additive manufacturing in less than 500 days. So imagine an industry which had a different kind of production system in place, it took them just 500 days, less than two years, to completely transition away and move into 3D printed hearing aids. Those companies that did not adopt this new technology were not able to survive. That goes to show the speed with which technologies can impact industries. On the flip side, there is this paper that I found uh, 
in the Scientific American from the early 80s, which talks about the mechanization of agriculture in the United States between 1880 and 1980. And what we see is farm population or people engaged in farming declined. The number of farmers, number of farms declined in, throughout that century. The average size of the farms increased. So individual farm size increased and the productivity per farm worker also increased through that century. But a lot of it happened slowly over time and, it, and it's, it took about a century for many of those changes to happen. And so to put it another way, change happens. To paraphrase Ernst Hemingway, change happens in two ways gradually, then suddenly. And it has varying impacts on different industries, different nations, different innovation ecosystems over different periods of time. When we look at these technologies and the ways they evolve and the ways they impact economies, a term that is commonly used, sometimes mistakenly, is disruptive technologies. These are technologies which initially start with lower performance, like say 3D printing, when compared to standard manufacturing technologies, where you would say that 3D printing is, is not up to the mark in terms of quality, in terms of the speed of production, in terms of the scale of production, yet it is rapidly improving over time. And at some point, it crosses a threshold and starts meeting market demand, which is what is starting to happen in many applications of 3D printing nowadays. So existing firms, which are driven by current technologies, should also always be aware of new technologies that are emerging and how quickly are these new technologies improving? And so we get to a question, are Canadian firms prepared for disruption? And a survey from Deloitte a few years back has found that many Canadian firms are not prepared. There is more work that needs to be done. Only a few of the firms are aware of other disruptive technologies, are agile enough, have the innovation culture in place, have extra resources that they can use to target new markets. And yet there is hope. For example, there's a company called 3DQ, started by a teenager from Vancouver, BC. He had been interested in 3D printing for a long period of time and found it to be a slow process where a lot of manual adjustments were needed. He figured out a way to develop software to automate 3D printing so that multiple 3D printers could be controlled in a single step. This company started in November last year with one employee. And in less than a year, it has 22 employees and a first installation at Mitsubishi. This is technology that's happening around us, developed by locals, supported by locals. Another example, Switch Health is a technology company out of Toronto. The founder, one of the main founders, had a background in big data and healthcare applications in big data. As COVID-19 hit, and as the news was coming in late January and early February, the founder decided to pivot his company, his startup, and started offering mobile testing 
instead of having people congregate in testing centers, he flipped the concept and said, what if, if we have mobile trucks or testing stations which go to people's homes or care homes or large organizations and get the testing done in their location? And this company has grown from five employees in January 2020 this year to 80 employees in September. So what do we learn? We learned something that has been pointed out by economists a century ago. In times of great change, in times of great uncertainty, there are challenges, but there are opportunities too. And Canadian entrepreneurs are great at spotting opportunities and working through challenges to succeed and grow and provide jobs for their communities. And how can we as a community, as a society, help entrepreneurs and students by developing an innovation ecosystem? So what is an innovation ecosystem? It is deliberately designed. It has innovation as its goal or focus. It has several entities to help define its boundaries. So what kind of entities do we have in an innovation ecosystem? It consists of universities, governments, firms from traditional and emerging industries, key personnel and innovation supports. So it's important to recognize that no single entity is fully able to assume all functions of the ecosystem. So it works when people collaborate, it works when entities trust and, and build partnerships. For the Fraser Valley, we have the university, we have firms, industry associations, community organizations, philanthropists, foundations, users, and governments all coming together to support entrepreneurs and students as they generate ideas and build these technologies forward. How can each of these stakeholders, many of these stakeholders play a role to build and strengthen an ecosystem? Universities can create interdisciplinary collaborative spaces to foster innovation and UFE is doing that. Universities can redesign courses, programs, to reflect rapidly changing labor markets. Universities can make innovation and entrepreneurship training more open, more accessible. They can promote research projects that are geared towards societal needs. They can develop supportive IP policies which allow the ideas that are generated in a university to move forward to raise financing. And why are universities so important? An aspect of technology development is also that it has impacts on the labor market. And hence, there is a need for reskilling. The reality that we now live in is that it's difficult to assume that people start in a job in their 20s and retire from that same job. What is now becoming more and more common is that people will be transitioning through multiple careers, through multiple industries, multiple sectors, and therefore the skills that they need is ability to work in interdisciplinary teams with people from different backgrounds, to be great at critical thinking, to be good at decision-making. These are all skills where machines or computers still do not have an edge. Humans lead in these areas. So low skill, low paid jobs, which are very routine, have a higher probability of getting automated. And so it becomes the role of universities to design these programs to help people reskill. 
Governments can participate in the development of innovation ecosystems, which allow co-location of startups, mature companies, and post-secondary institutes, redesigning post-secondary institutions into vibrant, diverse learning zones. Firms can build an innovative culture. One of the realities that we have, and one of the good things we have, is that many, many students and many employees are driven also by purpose. They are looking for meaning, meaningfulness in their work. They want to see positive social impacts due to the work they do. And so companies which build a culture which supports these activities will attract well-qualified employees. Firms should also learn to better manage risk. Firms can engage in collaborative research and course development with universities. One of the challenges that have been pointed out, that has been pointed out in, in many reports on, on the Canadian ecosystem is that we need to better protect and generate intellectual property. We need to be better at doing that. Firms also need to learn from failure. As we experiment, we will fail. And we need to build a culture which recognizes intelligent failure so, and so that we can keep on moving. So what is something that youth and those entering the job market in, in such challenging times, what should they be thinking about? They should be thinking about what skills do they have? What ways in which can they, and what areas can they perform better than computers or better than, than automation and focus their efforts on critical thinking, on decision-making skills, on working in teams, learning to collaborate. These are things where we have an edge and that is what is needed in the world we live in today and in the world we will we will reach in a few years time. With that, uh, I end my talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Wonderful talk, John. Thank you so very much. Like he mentioned, the chat section is open for questions. So please send questions your this way. I'm just going to take a quick browse through here. So we got a question here about failure. On top of government, university, and firm, as mentioned in your talk, it seems to me that to be innovative, we need to be taking risks and to be willing to fail. But those things aren't easy because of our own reputation uh, is at stake. Nobody wants to seem like a failure. So how can we create a support system that allows failure and risk in order to empower innovation and entrepreneurship? Sorry, it's a really long question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, I've got a two-year-old daughter and what I tell her when she plays with blocks and things fall apart is well you can try again right and what i feel is as as a culture as a society we are we are somewhat more risk averse than our neighbors south of the border and therefore the schools uh, and and the education system we have should encourage doing things for ourselves, experimenting, and asking assignments or developing assignments where there is reflection on failure. Any of the entrepreneurs who have succeeded have many, many, many failures behind their successes. And yet it is the successes that come to the fore. So I would suggest that when we work with our children at home, 
when we as teachers work with them in our schools, in our universities, to design projects, to choose topics in a way that encourages them to think about failure. If you don't fail, it probably also means that you chose something too easy to begin with. So we should tackle the tough problems that we face as a society. And when you tackle tough problems, you generally don't succeed at the first attempt. Beautiful. Very well explained. Um, can you talk a bit about how we could learn from other countries where innovation is taking place in a more robust way? Well, I'll say that uh, different countries have varying levels of success. One of the questions that is, that is very uh, apt also in the Canadian context is given limited resources, would we be wise to choose specific sectors that we are good at? Would we be wise to stick with the sectors that have worked for us? Or should we focus on new technologies and forget the old? So it is a classic challenge in that Older technologies, which have provided us the revenues and the funds uh, which have supported us, should we continue investing in them or should we move on to new technologies and forget the old? And it's not an easy answer. I cannot say that I'll give an answer for that right away, but it depends from sector to sector. It depends from province to province. And many factors are involved Industry ecosystems, innovation ecosystems have a lot of history embedded in them. And we have to recognize that and leverage that history and use opportunities to transition and build new stronger systems. I can give one quick example of a scientific problem uh, which was tackled by one particular discipline for 20 years and nothing changed. And when they brought in a new disciplinary lens, they were able to solve the problem in two years and a multi-million dollar company was formed. So many times, if you try solving an old problem using the same old tools, you're probably going to get the same old result. So when you have tried enough for a long time, you should have pilot programs, you should try testing out new technologies. I hope I've answered the question. Perfect. Um, we have another question here. Um, the best way to start a successful business is to see the need for something. When you see the need, but lack the money, skill, or knowledge, what do you suggest to do? So I would, I would think of it in terms of the industry. So there are no uh, quick answers. There are some industries which, are which have very entrenched and very established incumbent players who have deep pockets or much more resources than a startup could have. And if you are planning to compete with them head on, then there is a different set of strategies to be followed that could be tried out. One of the challenges uh, with the Canadian ecosystem is that we, we do have, if you, if you remember the, the figure that I showed at the start of my talk, we do have funding for research uh, at, at universities. Uh, and yet, many of those ideas, once they transition out of the university, uh, not all startups uh, get additional funding support. To, to link to the previous question, uh, the United States has programs like SBIR and STTR, which provides additional funding for startups in some form. And so 
for for someone looking or someone who has identified a need there are resources in canada to provide some support but definitely a lot more could be done and i would also suggest that you have to think very very carefully about the first market you target we have done research and uh, on a topic where we talk about technology market matching when you have a solution which can work for three markets as a startup you do not have the resources to target all three of them you will have to choose one and so the choice of that first market is very important because if you are successful you have now set up a revenue stream which allows you to expand but if you fail at the first one you probably will find it a lot tougher to try another market so it becomes very critical uh, i would have to know more about the idea before giving a more specific answer um how do you think the fraser valley can create an innovative ecosystem especially being so close to vancouver which is already a major innovative hub uh, there is a project that that i've been working on with with my students uh, where we are collecting patent data on the fraser valley and what we have seen is the valley is a valley of innovators a valley of inventors we have had successful companies who have grown and gotten acquired we have had successful tech companies which are regularly patenting now and these patents are across many of the cities of the valley so i would say that many of the parts of an innovation ecosystem already exist in the valley to me what i see as as uh, a factor that that could be thought of is managing expectations what tends to happen is that entrepreneurs are very very focused on their businesses and so and have very tight timelines universities and researchers have longer timelines so when we as researchers work on on a project or a topic our timelines might be a year or more and yet entrepreneurs want an answer yesterday because the problem for them is something very immediate so this is a a classic issue that uh uh that that shows how we work under very different paradigms and yet uh it is it is also important to, to recognize the value that we bring to each other and if we find the right problems to work on together there is a lot that can be achieved small firms entrepreneurs in most countries are more than 90% of the economy so it is entrepreneurs who are a significant portion of the economy of many many countries even though it's the larger firms that are much more recognized it is the smaller firms that are the backbone of a country's economy and so it is entrepreneurs all around us in the valley inventors around us in the valley the industry associations the accelerators the universities all of us are already there all of us are already working we just have to find ways to collaborate better beautiful and sort of uh tagging in with that last question um talking about sub communities um agriculture um is certainly a big driver here in the Fraser Valley um and focusing on ag tech how do you think we can create an ecosystem around ag tech uh what what we saw i'll i'll go back to some of the patent data that that we have collected what we saw uh and what we see happening in the valley already 
is that industries linked to agriculture are also growing. So we have companies which are in tools, trucking tools, uh, and, and peripherally, peripherally related to agriculture, these industries are also growing. So agriculture is important. Agriculture is growing. Technology is used in agriculture. Uh, we see the ecosystem as being broad. And in the longer term, it always helps to have more uh, industrial diversity. So even when we think of ag tech, I would say that the companies which supply to agriculture or which derive their sales from agriculture, uh, they are all connected in, in the ecosystem in different industry value chains. So ag tech should be defined broadly so that we can have a more diverse ecosystem. Diversity benefits because we can then target different markets and we can be more resilient as an economy. Beautifully said. Um, had another one. How do you see the move towards green industries fitting into the innovative ecosystem in the Valley? I think there are players in our Fraser Valley innovation ecosystem who are already working on, on these some of these aspects. Uh, in Canada now, we do have, um, I believe, more funding or more openness for clean tech initiatives. This again links back to one of the previous points I made where we sort of were thinking of old technology versus newer technologies and when should we, when should we move from an older tech to a newer one? Right, And the answer might be slightly different for each province, but I would think that in BC and in the Valley, uh, clean tech has deep roots. Deep roots in terms of basic research that informs a lot of the follow-on inventions and innovations done by the companies. So it's not a sector that is, that is new in any sense of the word, it has deep roots and therefore uh, it, there will be a lot of support and uh, awareness. So it's not uh, a case where you have to go out and convince people too much. There's a lot of interest in society. And, and I would see that uh, clean tech definitely is, is something to my mind that is holding the interest of the younger generation those are the kind of companies that they would like to work in because they want to see the social impact and the positive social impact of, of working with such companies. So I see both in terms of uh, attracting highly qualified personnel, building on the existing strengths in research, we have the possibility of focusing on clean tech more than other provinces. Perfect. And we have another one here on um, startup seed investment. Um, wondering why it's difficult to get startup cash for manufacturing in Canada. Um, recently in, man we have seen recently in the manufacturing of vaccines, are Canadians not as interested in investments or are investments varying from country to country? Well, uh, I'll, I'll start with a quick anecdote about, about a talk I attended at the BC Tech Summit, and I've mentioned it uh, a few times in, in other locations. We had two venture capitalists, one from Canada and one from the US sitting in a panel, and they got asked a really great question. It was at what stage uh, would you invest in a company? And the person from the US said, when the idea is written down on a napkin, 
And the person from Canada said, well, we'll wait for the company to be formed. We'll wait for about $10 million in annual revenues, and then we'll think about investing. And so that anecdote to me encapsulates the, the tremendous challenge that Canadian entrepreneurs face and, and hats off to entrepreneurs who, who are successful in Canada because it is, it, is a, it is a vibrant market, it's a resilient market, but it's also not an easy market to succeed in. Well said, I like that, that was great. <laughs> All right, did anybody else have any other questions for Dr. Thomas today? If not, we'll head into wrap up here. I'm not seeing any other questions popping through right now. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Th John Thomas for joining us. It was fantastic having you and we really appreciate your expertise. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Not a problem. I'm sure we'll see you again very soon. Thank you. Um, well, what a great evening so far. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Um, we have really loved having you here. And I just want to give another shout out to our amazing sponsors that do make this happen. The University of the Fraser Valley, the Abbotsford Tech District, Envision Financial, Connext UFB Alumni Association, TEDx Abbotsford, Abbotsford Community Foundation, as well as the City of Abbotsford and Vancouver Foundation. Thank you so much for your endless support. We love each and every one of you. Um, so coming up, we have our next and final science talk of the year. So make sure you don't miss out. That will be on December 1st at 7.30, first Tuesday, as always with Dr. Keith Carlson speaking on indigenous history and building reconciliation and dismantling settler colonialism. So make sure you don't miss out. As well, we would love to see you on social. So tune in, share the love um, on our Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, whatever your preference is, we would love to see you engaging on there. Um, 